We're going to read from the scriptures. We're going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And our thoughts this evening are going to be upon the rapture of the church. So verse 13 then of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words if you have been on any social media recently and by recently perhaps over the last year or so you may have noticed that there is a lot of expectation in christian circles on the lord coming back many believe because this is it seems that we are in a world now that has got everything that the lord jesus talked about is now converging into that narrow funnel of things and so we can see a lot happening And uh, people often say to me, is this Israel-Gaza war? Is this, you know, the end of it all? Is this where it's going to erupt into um, Armageddon? And I just have to say, you know what? It's too early to tell yet. We've got to just keep an eye on what's going on. But it does seem as though the world is gradually getting drawn into this conflict. And with Mr Netanyahu saying only yesterday, I believe it was, that once they have finished their operations in Gaza, they will take control of Gaza and the rat land has has caused a, a bit of a stir, I think, amongst world leaders. But if we look at scripture, they've got to regain their land, so I can see that happening. But anyway, you, you'll notice on, on, on the media that, that there is a, I'd almost call it a frenzy of people saying, the Lord is coming, the Lord is coming. The rapture of the church can't be far away. But then on the other hand, there are those that are now saying, yes, but when is the rapture? Is it, is it pre-tribulation? Is it mid-tribulation? Is it post-tribulation? And of course, that causes some confusion as well. I have to say right at the beginning that I'm a pre-tribulation rapturist. I think it's the next thing to really happen for the church, obviously, regardless of what's going on. But with Israel back in the land and, well, with the World Economic Forum in Davos at the moment trying to tell us how they're going to run the world and they're going to use UN legislation to make things binding on us. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard about the pandemic treaty from the World Health Organization. They want to use that to give the World Health Organization the power to take control of all the countries in the world. And it will be uh, binding on every country that signs up to it. And of course, they're going to push for everything so that they can say that if they think there is a pandemic coming, right, this is what you will do. Apparently, we have no say in the matter. So they can lock us down at a moment's notice and they don't even have to tell us what the pandemic is, only that they think there's one coming. Therefore, well, you can see where that's going to go, can't you? Your freedoms will be totally taken away, unfortunately. So there's a lot going on at the moment. Who know that things are well and truly happening. The book of Revelation, each of the letters to the churches of Revelation represents a call from God to that church. And throughout, of course, history, you can take a look at it, that each church represents a a period of history. Perhaps others will have a different view. But always there is this call by the Lord to turn back to him, to repent and uh, follow him. And we are living, I believe, in the time of the church of Laodicea, that church of what I'll call the present age, because the church of Laodicea was, if you like, the one that was neither hot nor cold. It was the one that... God said, I will spit you out of my mouth. You've either got to be one or the other and not this lukewarmness. And of course, we are living in a church, and I I mean that as an umbrella type, where the church has become very lukewarm. It doesn't 
look at the word of God as the word of God. It wants to change it so that it can uh, be what it wants it to be. It thinks that by changing the word of God that the church will be more relevant in the age in which we live. But of course it won't be. If you change the word of God and you go with the flow, you become irrelevant. You're no better than anything else. But God says, this is my word and I do not change. So we are in that time, I believe. And in Revelation 3.20, he, he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. I don't think any... At any time in history as the Christian church left Jesus outside as it's doing now. It's almost as though we don't want Jesus there and yet he's knocking on the door and he wants to come in. We've seen over the last few months particularly how the Roman Catholic Church and now the Church of England is going against God's word by starting to bless same-sex marriages and things like that. Again, going against the word of God. And, of course, this will introduce other things with it. There are, of course, openly gay policies that are totally changing the word of God and they're taking marriage out and they're, they're taking the male and female out of it and they're putting their own ways in it. And yet, what can we say about that, the world in which we live? 1 Peter 4, verse 17, says that the world is ripe for judgment. He says, for the time is coming that judgment must begin with the house of God. And if it first begins at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? A judgment is coming. We call it the tribulation period on the world, but the judgment will start with the house of God first. We need to get our house, as it were, in order. So there's a lot going on, but the rapture of the church is an encouragement to those who believe. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, therefore encourage one another with these words. He's talking to a group of people here that had a worry that those who had died were going to miss out. And he says, no, you won't miss out. Those people that have died will be raised first and then we will go with him. Those of us who are alive uh, and we will be with the Lord in the air. And so he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. And in chapter 5, verse 11, uh, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. We live in a time where we need to build one another up and encourage one another. Now, when you would normally talk about this, encouraging one another in the New Testament, it's usually on the lines of our Christian walk. Encourage each other to walk as Christ walked and, and that type of uh, encouragement in the footsteps of Jesus. But these two verses, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.18 and 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 11, are encouraging us uh, about the coming of the Lord. What he has just told them, that the dead will not miss out, and uh, those who are alive when that trumpet sounds and Christ comes again uh, will be whisked off up into the clouds. That's an encouragement to us. Now, there are those that think that we're going to go through the whole judgment of God, but that goes against these words. How can you encourage someone to go through, if you like, a seven-year tribulation period? What is there to be encouraged about there? But, of course, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, encourage one another that he's coming back for you. Uh, and that's not far away. They were speaking of the times of the end, the times in which I believe that we are living in, and um, he wants us all to be encouraged by it. Now, there may be those that have, as I say, an opposing view over that, and, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into that. That's OK. I don't mind if people have other views. I'm not going to fall out with anyone over that. I don't think that there's anything in arguing about it we all come up with our own things that scripture says and we put them in the order in which we believe but I'm going to take a simple approach this evening and hopefully encourage you to dig a bit deeper to be a good Berean on this subject so let me start and, and I often start by asking a question usually the seven year tribulation period is a period as I say of seven years where God is going to pour out his wrath upon the earth now, that wrath is going to be a totally unprecedented time in history that will make World War I and World War II look like a walk in the park. 
And I don't say that in the wrong way, because that was a terrible two wars that we thought would end all wars. And yet God's judgment is going to be so much more than, than what happened there in comparison. So Jesus says in Luke 21, verse 35, for it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. In other words, the whole earth is going to go through this. This is not going to be a regional thing. So the question is, how can I encourage you about that? How can I encourage you about the fact that God is coming to judge the world in such a terrible way? Well, I can't. But I can encourage you uh, in, in finding out about the fact that Jesus is coming for you and to take you before that happens so that you will be with him. So hopefully we can be encouraged in the days in which we're living, those days that are upon us. Now, if you look at the things that are happening around you, you will see, indeed, there is a convergence of many things happening. It's not just happening in, in Israel with different things uh, being passed. You can see the way the schools are going with um, what they're teaching the children now and stuff like that. It's all coming together just as Jesus said it was. And if you look into things such as transhumanism and all of those things, again, you know, Jesus said it will be as in the days of Lot, but he also said it will be as it were in the days of Noah. I was once a little bit puzzled about when Jesus said it would be like it would be in the day of flood. They will be given in marriage and drinking and stuff like that. And I thought, but that's normal living, isn't it? You know, we, we marry and we give in marriage and we give drinking and stuff like that. But that wasn't really what was going on in Noah's day. In Noah's day, of course, we read in, in Genesis chapter 6 that the sons of God were looking upon the women and daughters of men and they were coming down and they were taking them and they were having sex with them and they were bearing children with them. And these children become basically the Nephilim, these giants, these men of stature. But the problem was they were mixing the seed and that was what God was totally against. If you, if you want to do a study, do a study on what God thinks about the mixing of different seed. Not just man, but seeds as in harvest and stuff like that as well. God is totally against it. So that was what was going on. And we're seeing that now. We are seeing the way man is mixing the seed and doing things and using technology as well. So things are converging quite quickly. Often people say to me, but how can we prepare? How can we be ready for such an event? Well, in Matthew 24, of course, Jesus says, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. And, uh, of course, in the day in which we live, it's very easy to be deceived. What is the truth these days? How do we even know that the person in front of us is a person? You know, um, I was only watching a very short clip earlier on today on, on Facebook where uh, a guy said, right, I'm filming myself, but actually it's not me. This is, uh, if you like, almost like a robot using this new technology. Uh, and, of course, it looked very... It looked just like a man. It was talking like a man, but it wasn't a man. So how do we know who's who anymore? That's the world in which we live. And so Jesus quick says, do not be deceived. In other words, check it all out before you go down that particular road. But the only way to be prepared for what is coming is to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour. And in John 14, verse 6, of course, Jesus said to them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The world wants to get to God, if you like, in whichever way it wants to go. But Jesus says, no, there is only one way. So the tribulation is coming upon all who live on the face of the earth. That means you and I, unless we are taken out of the way, which I believe we will be there. There are those who will say that God will keep us safe through the tribulation. And uh, almost like put in, when Noah was put in the ark and he was kept safe through the floods. But actually, that's not what Noah represents. Noah actually represents, I believe, the rapture of the church from the judgment to come. This judgment is coming upon everybody. How are you going to get through the tribulation period on your own? Because that's what you will be. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be removed from the world beforehand to allow the Antichrist to come in. So if you think that way, um, it ain't going to happen that way, I'm I, I assure you. I feel very confident of that. 
mainly because the word of God tells us what will happen. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 9 and 10, it says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. The judgment that's coming is the wrath of God. There are those that will say, but the first half isn't really the wrath of God. That's the second part. No, it's not. It's all the wrath of God. In fact, who opens the very first seal that begins the whole tribulation off? It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So the whole of the wrath of God is coming. And he did not appoint us to suffer wrath. That's the first point there. Romans 2 verse 5 also says, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. This is, he's talking about those who do not know Christ. Then his righteous judgment will be revealed. You know, the Lord looks upon the world and it sees where it's going. And there's going to come a day when he says, right, enough is enough. And that's when this will all, as I would call it, kick off. Revelation 6 verse 16 says they call to the mountains and the rocks fall on us hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it that wrath is coming on the whole world and Revelation 3 verse 10 says since you have kept my command to endure patiently I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Friends, I don't believe you're going to be here. I believe that the rapture of the church will take place first before the wrath of God comes. The hour of trial is mentioned quite clearly throughout chapters 6 through to 19 of uh, the book of Revelation. So these, the church in these scriptures that I've just quoted to you alone mean that we're not going to be there. We, we, we will be gone. But if that's not enough to convince us, then why not look at the character of God? All right, we know that in Hebrews 13, Jesus has said, he is the same yesterday, today and forever. Therefore, we can be assured that nothing has changed. God has not moved the goalposts. Okay, what he said 2,000 years ago when Jesus was on the earth is still the same as it is Today, he has not changed. We know that Christ is God in human form. He came down from heaven earth as a human being. And we know that Jesus didn't change either in, in his approach and in the things that he did. So we can, we can have trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he said. And if we look back over the whole of scripture, when God was going to pour out his wrath upon man for their sins, what does he do? If you look over the scriptures, you'll see that, first of all, he takes the righteous out of the way. There are many things that we, we can look at. First of all, as I've already quoted, Noah was placed in an ark. He was taken out of the way. He was kept uh, so that when the flood came, Noah and his family that would not have been contaminated like the rest of those contaminated through the, the sons of God had been. And therefore, he kept them safe. And he saved them from that ungodly world. Then there's Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah? The angel of the Lord had said to Abraham, I'm going to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham and the angel had this um, well, little argument in a sense, didn't he? He said, well, but if there's 50 there, will you not save it? And God said, yes, if there's 50, I won't. And then he pushed him further and he got it right down. Uh, and in the end, of course, there wasn't even five really, that, um, that believed. And so God was going to do something. But he sent his angels in. And in Genesis nineteen twenty two, he sends them to, to Lot. And he says, you've got to get out of the city. And in verse 22, it says, but flee there quickly because I cannot do anything until you reach it. He's saying to Lot, look, you've got to reach that place up there before I can do anything. That place called Zor. And so the angel of God literally dragged him out of the city uh, to get out of the way before the wrath of God came down. When the Israel was leaving Egypt, God got the Israelites through the sea, didn't he? And then made the sea come back in to kill the Egyptians on the way. So God saved his people every time he saves his people before he brings judgment. 
The writer to the Hebrews states in Hebrews 13 verse 5, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Does that not encourage us? It should do, shouldn't it? We are not alone. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 5, Paul says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is read already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Now, if the one that is holding him back is the Holy Spirit, which I believe he is, when he is taken out of the way, if we are still here, what does that mean? It means that God has broken his promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. So if the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way, logic tells me that I've got to go as well because he lives within me. So he's either going to break his promise, and we know he doesn't do that because he is the same yesterday, today and forever, or I'm going to go with him. And so I am rather certain, I have to say, that the Lord will take me with him uh, before that dreadful day happens. So very simply, we as Christians have the spirit of God and we will not be left alone when the Antichrist appears. Lastly, I believe that the, uh, the scriptures also show us that the rapture is imminent. If we read uh, Romans chapter 13, for instance, verses 11 and 12, it says, And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Paul was always expecting the return of Christ. It's a shame that so many in the church don't feel that way. In James chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, it says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. It's imminent. It could happen at any moment of time. That also means, of course, that if it is right at the door, it's almost ready to happen that it can't happen halfway through the tribulation period. Because, you know, the Bible also tells us that no one will know the day or the hour. We can't put a date on it. And if we can't put a date on it, then it can't happen when we're in the tribulation period. Because once we're in the tribulation period, we know when the three and a half years are going to be, and we know when the seven years are going to be, and we can put a date on it. So that doesn't make any sense. So the, the rapture of the church could come at any time. There is nothing in Scripture to hold him back. Now, Jesus gave a parable of the ten wise and foolish virgins. And clearly, it's a parable about the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And it ends with these words in uh, Matthew 25, verse 10. It says, but while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And of course, Jesus there in this parable is referring to the wedding banquet of the Hebrew nation. It's how they did things. And of course, when a couple were betrothed, they were in effect sort of married, but the husband-to-be would go off and he would go back to his father's house and he would prepare a place for him and his bride to be and when he had prepared that place and when the father said yep yeah, everything's done everything's written now you can go and fetch her then he would come back and he would fetch her this is what this picture of this this parable represents it represents the returning of christ for his church for his bride and he has gone what did he say in john i go to prepare a place for you so that you might be where i am 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to be with me. What a wonderful thing that is. And so these virgins missed out because they weren't ready, because they'd gone off, if you like, wandering. They were not staying close to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're told, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So the Lord is coming back. Everything is being put into place. And although the rapture has always been imminent, everyone will say that, of course, you know, it was imminent in Paul's day. It's still imminent today. And it could have happened at any time in history, but it didn't. It is still to come. But when we look around us, when we see what is happening, when we see that Israel is back in the land, when we see that all of the prophecies concerning Israel have just about been fulfilled, when we see all the other things going on, the times of Noah, the times of Lot, we have to look and say, time is almost up. It is still imminent. We live in a time when never before has all these things come together like they are at this moment. The church is being prepared. It is being judged. I think perhaps COVID had a little bit of a, a judging call on that, you know, where the church, some of the church was split from the others by this pandemic. And we had all sorts of things happening. We had churches closing. We had Christians refusing to meet with other Christians and so on. It's being judged. We are now being judged upon where we stand on the word of God. And God will not let that go by. When the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise, we also will follow them in the twinkling of an eye. My question now to you is, are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that day? There is only one way to be ready, and I said it at the beginning, you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour. Without that, you will be left behind. Have you repented of your sin? Have you turned to him and given your life to him? He gave his life for you. He went through unimaginable pain and suffering for your sin and my sin. Not his own sin. He hadn't sinned at all. He went through it for us to make us ready for eternal life. You can't rely on coming up through a Christian family. I was talking to a lady this morning. She said, I've always been a Christian. I was brought up as a Christian. My mum and my dad always went to church. And I thought, yeah, that's very nice, but that doesn't save you. It doesn't matter what good you do, it will not save you. Without Christ, you are lost and you are not ready for that day. So. I would beseech you that if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, to seek him right now, today. Don't leave it till tomorrow. We don't know if we have tomorrow, do we? We don't know if we'll get home uh, tonight even. We don't know what time we have. And of course, the Lord could come in the meantime. We've got 10 minutes till 7 o'clock. He could come in that time. Who knows? But one thing, and I'll end on this just about, is in Revelation 22, verses 12 to 17 he says this look I am coming soon my reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done I am the alpha and the omega the first and the last the beginning and the end blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city outside are the dogs those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I hope those words encourage you to look up 
before he is coming. To look up for your salvation is near. And the only way to be caught up with him is to know him as your Lord and Saviour.